I want to talk today about what makes us different, and specifically how what makes us different can actually be our superpower. And my story starts back when I was 12. I, I not only didn't like college, but I really didn't like elementary school. I came to my parents when I was 12, and, uh, and, and what, one of the two things that I discovered was that I really, really didn't like school. And my, my mom was a public school teacher at the time, my dad an engineer, so they, they, they weren't exactly thrilled with this, but I came and sat down with my parents and said, I've got some tough news to break to you. I'm not gonna go to school in sixth grade. They didn't think I was quite so serious at, at, at the time, and they spent many sleepless nights wondering whether or not I, I would succeed outside school. But eventually they came to understand that it was my life and I was going to make my own decisions. And if I wanted to leave school, they said, well, go ahead. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? You might go back, right? I became an unschooler, the self-directed form of homeschooler. I wasn't following any prescribed curriculum, my parents weren't teaching me, my life wasn't governed by tests, and I wasn't graded at the end of the year. I do want to make one distinction before going forward, which is that homeschooling is not the same thing as unschooling. What I was doing didn't look much like school at all, and I didn't spend much time at home. I'd left school not because I didn't want to learn evolution, but because I wanted to take charge of my own education. So while my peers sat in, in class throughout middle school and high school, I went out and volunteered in my community, I worked on political campaigns, I organized collaborative learning groups, I uh, was able to help build a, a, a library in my hometown, I went to conferences, I worked at startups in Silicon Valley, and was even able to live in France for half a year. I was able to do all these things that I never would have been able to do had I been in the classroom. And yet I still learn the same things. After middle school and high school, I still learn the same things, and although I never had a high school graduation, went off to college. I recall that, one of the, that, that, that first year as an unschooler, I took an art history class, and I was assigned to do a report on Henry Matisse. I distinctly recall Googling the name of one of his paintings, Pink Nude, with no idea that I was going to get explicit search results. Now, as a 12-year-old, you can imagine this was really, really exciting to me. And I was really glad that my mom was out shopping that afternoon <clears throat> so that she wasn't there, and I could spend the time poking around the internet, and I discovered that there were both pink nudes in the male and female form. And after exploring some more, I discovered that I preferred the guys to the girls, which brings me to the second discovery of what I learned about myself when I was 12 that has shaped my life today, which is that I'm gay, I'm sexually attracted to men, and that makes me, along with being a dropout, a misfit in many ways. This summer, I dated a lovely young man who, instead of feeling free to flourish or grow, as I had, instead felt pressure to be both straight and to be an academic success. And what's interesting is that although I discovered both of these things about myself when I was 12, neither of them really had much impact on me. I never felt straight to be an academic or to be straight or to be an academic success. I was free to live without expectations. So this guy I was going out with this summer had quite the opposite experience, and instead of feeling free to flourish and grow, felt pressure to conform to society. He grew up trying to be straight all throughout middle school and high school until he finally came out after his ju junior year of college. But he didn't just come out then. He purposely failed all of his college classes so that, quote, being gay wouldn't be the thing he hated most about himself. Take a moment to think about the gravity of that statement. Being gay wouldn't be the thing I hated most about myself. That meant that for him, being gay, be, or rather, being an academic failure was worse than being gay. I, I had a really hard time understanding this because for me, neither of these things were particularly re remarkable. Not only had I not really faced adversity for them, but if, any, if anything, they'd actually worked to my advantage. Several times I've had close gay friends confide in me that they still wished they were straight, in the same way that this guy I was going out with still wanted to be an academic success. And about a year ago, I um, had the misfortune of, being, of, of witnessing um, a suicide. I, a, a, an a, acquaintance of mine um, was found dead in his room. He died from suffocation, covering his own head with a plastic bag. And I tell this story because what was amazing to me was the, 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 for the week afterwards when people asked me, how was your weekend, and I would relate the story, their response was something like this. They said, well, you're gay. 
you surely must have contemplated suicide. And that's not the case. I was just flabbergasted that people assume that just because I'm a misfit in some small way, just because I have a little bit of a non-centered experience, that that must be a reason to remove myself from this earth. And I started thinking, maybe, maybe it's less about being a misfit, and maybe it's more about not realizing that I'm a misfit by societal standards. In fact, the, the, the worst reaction that I ever had to coming out was when I first added my first boyfriend on Facebook, was a friend who emailed me asking, really? Really? But I think that had a little bit more to do with the fact that the guy I was calling my boyfriend was a guy that I'd never met who lived 4,000 miles away than the fact that I was coming out as gay for the first time. And the interesting thing is not, is not just that neither being gay nor being a dropout has really affected me, but it's actually worked to my advantage. And I've concluded that there's a pink mafia of sorts, a network of people with similar experiences who help each other out. Now, when I first told, I, I, I first thought this up while I was browsing Grindr. Now, Grindr is a, a gay dating app where you can see gay men in the proximity around you. You can, you can read profiles, you can see pictures, you can chat with guys. And what's interesting is that when you're setting up your, your, your profile, you can choose why you're there. You can choose friends, dates, relationships, and even an option for networking. That was supposed to be funny, but nobody laughed. <laughs> um, there is actually an option for networking. Um, and and while, while that seems like a, a, a really silly thing to be used on an application that's mainly for hooking up, as you might have guessed, um, it's actually very, very true. And there are distinct ways in which being gay has worked to my advantage. I crash parties at the World Economic Forum because I'm gay. I uh, got a pass to attend TED Long Beach because I'm gay. I've had people uh, offer me jobs because on that basis. I've helped, had people offer me introductions to people because, because I'm gay. Um, I just finished a book uh, for Penguin called Hacking Your Education, which is largely a blueprint for how to go about educating yourself based on, your, uh, on my experiences learning outside of school. But along the way, I interviewed dozens of other people about their experiences of how they found success outside of college as well. And as I was going back and looking through the people that I'd interviewed, I, I, I realized that there were a number of interviews of high-profile people that had happened more or less specifically because I'm gay. They're not people that I would have met otherwise. It was the basis of a conversation. And that's not to say that this happened only because I'm gay, but rather because it was a starting point. It was a shared experience, and it was the start of a conversation. And we, when you al allow that to happen, you can build a community of people with shared values. When I first told my mom about this, she was like, so who'd you sleep with? Which I suppose is a reasonable question, but the answer is nobody. The reality is that this is not about sexual advances. It's not about sex. It's about building a community of people who have common experiences, whether it's about being gay or whether it's about being a dropout. And it was, as, I, as I was thinking about this more, I realized that this isn't just me. I started asking some friends who were also gay dropouts if they'd had the same experience. And I heard stories of people finding, finding, uh, find, finding investors because they're gay, people who found um, business development opportunities because they were gay, people who found agents because they're gay. I was talking with a friend, one of the ones who I interviewed for the book, about the Velvet Mafia, and he told me that in Hollywood, he used to be high, high up and report directly to Michael Eisner, the gay CEO of Disney, that there used to be something called the Velvet Mafia of, of gay men in politics and media. But this is not just gay men, and it's not just in politics and media. The people who have helped me out are in all industries, from business to technology to media to arts. And they're every shade of queer, from bisexual to polysexual to pansexual to transsexual and more. Out Magazine now even ranks the 50 most powerful gay men and women from around the world across all industries. And in San Francisco, there's even a, a group for queer entrepreneurs called Startup. But I was thinking, does this, is this just about being gay and is this just about being dropping out? Are there other pieces of being a misfit or other pieces of common experiences that can lead to professional advantages? And s someone mentioned the PayPal Mafia, the group of people that's often re referred to in San Francisco who all once worked at PayPal and have gone on to start or invest in other prominent companies. And then I was reminded of a conversation that I had with my friend Tiffany McCall. Tiffany's a friend of mine who I originally interviewed for my book because she's an awesome person. She dropped out of college when she was 20, 
as a single mother and taught herself to code. And later that year, got a job as a Java developer at Accenture. And one of the things that Tiffany told me that really stuck with me was that when she'd show up for meetings, people would expect her to get coffee, because no one could imagine that the black girl with frizzy hair from the south side of Chicago could possibly be the one writing code. And what Tiffany told me is that she turned that into a personal challenge, a challenge to show the world that black girls with frizzy hair from the south side of Chicago can write awesome code. And along the way, she said she got help from people who shared some or part of her experience. And it was that mindset that allowed her to take what could let weigh you down into something that can work distinctly to your advantage. What Tiffany showed me is that it doesn't have to be gender or sexuality that you can turn on its head. Maybe it's that you're an introvert, an atheist, or someone who hates rock music. Maybe you speak a particular language or belong to a particular ethnic group. When you admit to being part of one of these perhaps unpopular minority associations, you form a bond, a connection point, and it can start a conversation. And that conversation can lead anywhere. So maybe, just maybe, there's actually an advantage to being a misfit. That you can take whatever might hold you back, your status, your sexuality, your hair, your gender, whatever it may be, and turn it on its head. Instead of letting it be a crutch, let it drive you. Let it propel you. To show the world that you can write awesome code even if you don't have the credentials of the other people in the room and happen to wear a dress. To show the world that you can write a book and run an organization without going to college. If you embrace what makes you vulnerable, the world can be much larger than you can imagine. I think that we, the misfits, have a responsibility to be visible and a responsibility to be authentic. We have a responsibility to be awesomely weird. My request for you today is this. Make known whatever makes you different. Instead of letting it be something to hide, let it be something to be proud of to shout from the rooftops and stand in a room of, of 2,000 people and proclaim. By sharing with the world what makes us different, we bring credibility to our chosen paths and let everybody else know that it's okay to be whoever you are. Thank you. <laughs>